Here's a really nice um, liner if you want. So you have no idea where those brushes went that I got you? Hmm? You don't know where those brushes went that I got you for? They're in the house someplace. Okay. Where do you normally keep all of your brush stuff? I have brushes in my office, in my art case. Okay, that's where I found these. I usually do everything in one, one brush. How do you do large areas? Johnny one note. How do you? Uh, but how do you get large areas of color with you one take small more brush? Time. Okay. See, if you want little, you go little strokes. If you want big, you want big strokes. That sounds like it takes a lot of time. I don't do this for my pleasure. I do this to spend my time. Okay, but you're not. Wait, you just said that you don't do it for pleasure, so it's not pleasurable? Could be. When I make a mistake, when it turns out poorly, mm -hmm. when it looks like a, a buffalo instead of a guy, Okay. then I'm not happy. I wasted a whole lot of time. Can you hand me those two browns that are right there? Is this a test? Yes, it's a test. You're passing. Uh, thank you. I have found that it's easier to sketch in like a burnt umber with paint and mm -hmm. then and then go over it with mine, more paint. Mine is number six wing zero. You what? My hair color is a number six wing zero. <laughs> oh, okay. This is interesting. I have not painted that. It's since I had my shoulder replaced, so I'm shaking. Okay. Like, it hurts? No, it's just out of control. Okay. That might make it really good. I can do anything. Yeah, you can. What do you think is the hardest thing you've ever done? All right, what? What do you think is the hardest thing you've ever done? Too bad at me. What made it so hard? Why is it so hard? Mm -hmm. What made it so hard? You're doing your best, and you're feeling really good about yourself. And you have your sack officers, the lieutenant, the captain, and 35 men telling you you're a piece of crap. Uh -huh. and you're never going to make it. And women don't belong in the business. And it's really hard to harden up and go down there every day knowing that you're going to be called names and put in the corner. So why did you finish? What got you through that? My daddy told me you always finish what you start. I had my husband, my friends, everybody I knew was behind me and helped me get into the academy and make it through the academy. I could not fail. If I failed, I wouldn't have anybody left. So I worked at it. And the first day of the academy, two men got sick, threw up, and quit. I figured if they, if they can give up, and one day I can make it too. So I went back. Oh, yeah, I'm birthing you. That was one of the hardest things I ever you did. You weren't even awake. Was I awake? You weren't even awake when I was born. No. But wherever I was, I was taking pictures. Mm. So when you talk about the academy and whenever you've talked about police work, it always sounds like the biggest motivator has been other people, like what other people would think of you or you finishing or something like that. I think that's just really interesting because you never say that like you wanted it. A little bit of pride and 
stamina going on in the chest. There we go. I'm going to show them they're wrong. Yeah, I but mean. Well, the policemen, male police officers, had to show them they were wrong once. The female police officers had to show them that they were wrong every day. Every stinking day. It never led up to the day I retired. They always had some reason why they wanted to mess with me. But I beat them. Um, when did you, when did you know you were a feminist? I don't know. When do you know? Or do you just become who you think is important? Well, I guess, like, when did you have a name for it? No. When did you have a name for this feeling of wanting, to, of, difficult. like, dealing with men? I don't know that I had a name for it. I was difficult. I was pushy. I, when a man is pushy, he's aggressive and he's doing the right thing. When a woman is pushy, she's a bitch. Mm -hmm. So I figured I must be a bitch. Because I had things I wanted to do and they wouldn't let me. So I changed direction and started over again, but I never gave up. But was there a time like, because, you know, like the, the feminist movement in the 70s and stuff, was there a time when you knew you were a part of it? No, I never thought it that way. I received a phone call from the, the ladies' fan shop, like LA, LAPD, mm -hmm. filed a lawsuit against LAPD. Mm -hmm. It was a big thing. These women had been desk officers and uh, gophers for many years, and they wanted to be promoted to lieutenants and sergeants and, and tell the men where to go. So they took a test, and they wouldn't let them. They were told they could not uh, they could not take a test because they were women and they didn't have the proper background. So they filed a lawsuit against Ed Davis, LAPD, uh -huh. and they won. And Ed had to promote all the women in his department. And they were all happy and he was unhappy. Um, Fanshawe Blake called me. And they didn't identify themselves. They said, would you like to, do, do you work in a police car? Yes. Do you work by yourself? Yes. Do you arrest men? Yeah. Do you carry a gun? I mean, really stupid questions. Uh -huh. And I said, yeah, 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 and all of it. And they said, well, you'll get your subpoena in about six months. And what subpoena? Wait, was that because they didn't let the LAPD female officers do any of that, but you were allowed to? So they were trying to prove I that as a woman police officer, you were fine on your own. I was the only woman they could find that did exactly what the men did without a second person in the car. And they were going to use me to show that women could do it. I said, no, I won't. I will be a hostile witness. They said, why is that? I said, well, I'd like to say that I care what happens to you. I want to give you money and status and make you happy with your life. But in reality, I'm really thinking of myself. I have spent years getting them to accept me. If I come out in a lawsuit, I would be really in a lot of trouble at work. So that's when I knew I wasn't what I thought I should be because I didn't have the guts to stand up. I should have just gone to court. I went to court later on for other officers that had been treated bad against the city. I was the witness against the city. And I thought I may have made up for it, but I don't know. I'm kind of taken aback by this. I didn't know that you did that. What kind of thing was? 
I'm kind of taken aback by this. I didn't know that you did that. That I did what? Not testify? Yeah. Not testify. To not testify. Yeah. Would you say that's one of your biggest regrets? Mom. What? Would you say that's one of your biggest regrets? Yeah, I think so. They, they made it without me. And, uh, I should have been more aggressive than I was. And I, was, I wanted to get ahead, and I worked hard to get there. And, Do you think that one of the things that patriarchy does, though, is to create a feeling like there's a competition? Like you have to put, you have, you have to only think of yourself and protect that? That, that I, that's like the system wants you to think that so that it, so that it, nothing changes? They established that a long time ago, that women did not help other women. They shot them in the back. Yeah, yes, I mean, because I remember you telling me stories about other women doing that to you. Oh, yeah. There was a woman we hired, the second one after me, about seven years later. And I said, I'm going to do the right thing. I went out and I bought a flower for her. I took a tour in records, it was a big crowd. And I said, hi, my name is Katie, and I just wanted to welcome you to Ontario TV, et cetera, et cetera. And she says, I'm so surprised and happy you did that. I said, well, good. She says, because everybody said you'd be such a bitch. <laughs> I said, excuse me? She said, well, the women where I worked before said that you'd always had the lay of the land. You could do anything you wanted to. And now you were going to have competition. And I said, honey, you are not my competition. And I walked away. Then they called me and they said they were going to put her in a narcotics unit. Mm -hmm. I said, no, you don't want to do that. Why? That's what you did to me. You put me in special places. Made the men hate me thinking I was getting special treatment. Treat her like everybody else and she will do fine. She thought that was me trying to um, undermine her and it didn't go well after that. Hey mom, mm -hmm. um, will you tell me how our family came over from Russia? Like what? How our family came over from Russia. The story is told to me, and the reason I'm the keeper of the stories is because nobody else cared, was that Grandpa, our great-grandfather, Berkowitz, was married, had a couple of children, was captured, passing out the Declaration of Independence in Moscow Square, and sentenced to Siberia. He and great-grandma escaped. Mm -hmm. In a load of hay. And With their children? Huh? With their children? You said that he had children, so they brought their children also? They brought their children. I didn't question the story. Okay. I just accepted it for whatever they told me. And in doing so, they wound up in Whitechapel, England where your grandfather was born. He was born in Whitechapel, baptized in Whitechapel, and at the age of about six, they <coughs> left Russia and went to, I don't know where, I was unable to find them. I checked all the registries on ships, and I don't know when or how he came over, but it's not Ellis Island. I think maybe Canada or someplace on the East Coast. Anyway, they arrived here. They spent some time in Colorado. They spent some time in various places and ended up in Riverside, California. 
Why would he be baptized? Why would he be baptized? I don't know. I'm, and you can go on uh, the computer and see the baptismal paper. So I've seen it, so he was baptized. Do you think that that's so that they could... Oh, um, uh, he wasn't Jewish in his mind. He was an atheist. Okay. Grandpa Berkowitz was... Therefore, he, he, my father was agnostic uh -huh. because he was never raised in a temple or a church. So he's a secular Jew. That's just, but that still doesn't explain why they would baptize. Other than, like, do you think that they thought that they would have a harder time immigrating unless they were Christian? I don't know. They got here. Then one of the reasons we had trouble finding them is they changed their name. There was so much anti-Semitism in the air. They changed their name to from Berkowitz to Berko. And we have found some Berkos in San Francisco. We ended up in San Francisco. And the only reason we've been interested in them is they had all the same children's names that we had been told were in our family. Did I ever tell you what I found in no. my research? No. Um, so what I found is that they didn't change their names. They were Berkowitz. And that... Um, they came in 1890, and um, there was, were there two wives? I don't know. Was he ever remarried? Great-grandpa? Mm-hmm. Great, it would be great-great-grandfather. Rosa was his wife's name. Okay. So there, when they came over, there was a Rose, and Rose said that she was from Odessa. And around 1890 in Odessa were the pogroms. Do you know what the pogroms are? Mm. Um, so at that time, um, basically, they're, they're, Jews were only allowed to live in the the way west of Russia, and uh, it makes sense that she would be coming from Odessa because that was a Jewish city. That was one of the only places that they were allowed to live. And uh, so around that time, I think it was maybe 1878, 1879, 1890, something like that, um, there were a bunch of riots, and they raided a bunch of Jewish villages, and they killed a bunch of Jews. And, uh, and, and nobody was, like, arrested for it or anything like that. Um, in fact, the Jews who tried to defend themselves were arrested for trying to defend themselves. And so... Um, so the fact that they came from eight, in 1890 and that it says that she was from Odessa, it makes me think that they were fleeing the pogroms. And so if great-grandpa was baptized, it makes me think that they tried to do that because they were having trouble immigrating. Could be. Um, and they came to New York. And then they went to Chicago, and they were in Colorado for a little while, and then they came to Watts, and then Riverside. I have a, a postcard that one of them sent back east um, from Watts in like 1911, 1910 or something like that around that time. 
So yeah. who told you the history? I don't know. It's been so long. Uh huh. That I can't tell you. There weren't many of the Burke Woods around. There's a lot of them now because a lot of the kids like you have decided that you want to be a Burke Woods. Well, I took your maiden name because, um, because I think that the idea that I would have my father's last name and not also my mother's last name is patriarchy. So I added your last name because I come from you just as much as I come from dad. Well, your cousin Shelley is now a Burgle with. Uh huh. And you're a Burgle with. So it's not going to die out with your Uncle Charles. Um, um, can you tell me what you know about dad's family? Okay. Dad's family was from, um, they go back to a big history. Mm -hmm. They brag about coming over on the Mayflower. Uh, this is the brass candlestick they brought with them on the Mayflower. Mm -hmm. That they settled in Tennessee, I think. And Georgetown. Huh? Ohio. Huh. They didn't come to Tennessee until well, excuse me until the tw the twenties. He uh, uh, I don't know. Daddy's family went to Ohio. Mm hmm They. I'm thinking poorly. It's okay. Take your uh, time. Dad's father's father was a very wealthy man mm -hmm. in Tennessee when they wound up and he had furniture stores and made a lot of money and he gave it all to your dad's father your grandfather who wanted to be a nice guy and give everybody a piece of the pie so he uh, allowed people to buy things on time which was something unheard of at the time. Mm -hmm. And people did. They bought things on time, but they didn't pay him back. So he wound up losing his shirt. And your dad, dad, grandpa, tried to make up for it, but he didn't. He didn't make up for it. He, he lost his shirt. They all went bankrupt. He lost everything. Daddy came out here with his mother. Because Grandma then, left Grandpa, right? Yeah. And then eventually she allowed Dad to join Grandpa. Mm -hmm. And that's how they got here and that's where they were. They had a lot of family history in during the Civil War, a member of the family was a surgeon. That and guy, right? That would be Winslow up there. Mm -hmm. And his wife, and he, when he was at battle, mm -hmm. mending people, he would write home every day in a journal what he saw, what he felt. And we have those journals. Mm -hmm. We have letters that he sent. We have part of his uniform. We have his sword. We have the pictures of the family. And it's really exciting to look at. In my family, my father gave me two humpback albums full of pictures. And when I did our genealogy on Ancestors.com, they were all named in the genealogy. I'm trying to do what you said I need to do. What, loosen up? Paint loose. Yeah. I didn't outline it much. I'm you know, the thing is that we don't really have outlines on our face anyway, you know? 
Oh, this is fun. Yeah? We should do this more often. Which part is fun? Just hanging out and talking or painting? I'm doing both. Okay. I've, since I contracted this condition that I have, I've had difficulty doing anything more than one at a time. Mm -hmm. I can walk, I can't chew gum. Yeah. This is a real tr test for me mm -hmm. to talk to you and paint at the same time. How do you think you're doing? Excellent day. Um. You know, in contemporary art, sometimes the process is more important than the finished thing. What's well, important to me is if I like it at the end. Well, that's what I'm saying is sometimes the act of doing something is more important than the thing you get, right? I've always been very hard on myself. Why do you think that is? Because everybody else was hard on me. And they made me think I wasn't worth anything. So I was. Why do you think you kept going and persisting if you didn't think that you were worth anything? Why do you think I kept going what? Kept going and persi persisting if you didn't think that you were worth anything. I was trying to prove something. That I was worth something. That I had something to share. What do you think your biggest accomplishment is? Biggest what? Accomplishment is. You. Me? Oh, there was some time there. I didn't think it was going to work out. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Thanks, dude. Well. You were the sweetest, gentlest, nicest little girl that I ever knew. Uh huh. You were polite. You did what you were told. And then you turned 15. And your head started going around in circles, green stuff rushing from your ears. You were a monster. But don't you think that's every teenage girl? No. I knew lots of teenage girls. Some of them were worse than you. Most of them were not. You were. What was so bad about me? Uh, you were too damn smart for your own good. Okay, that doesn't sound bad. Well, it depends on what you use the smartness for. What did you think I was using it for? To get your way. You were smarter than your parents. Okay. So is the issue that you couldn't control me? Did I try to control you? I mean, is that the what you're having the problem with when I was younger? Is that I was difficult to control? I had difficulty controlling you. And if you could have controlled me easily, that would have been better? Yeah. But don't you think that then I would be, I would have a really hard time making my own choices and being my own person? Well, if I was easily controlled, that wouldn't that have made me vulnerable? Until you get to the age where you know what choice to make and what the harm will come for not making the right decisions, you let your parents make your decisions. And once they've got you online that this is good and that is bad, then you make your own decisions, but you started real early. Real early. But I turned out okay. Yes, you did. But I'd say the last three years, you've been a real human. Three uh, years? Yeah, before that, I wouldn't, wouldn't put any money on it. You're bright and articulate, and I'm really impressed with who you turned out to be. Good thing. A lot of times when you talk about police work, 
do you see any parallels behind how you feel like kind of invisible as a disabled person and how people don't seem to know how to talk to you and it feels like maybe people don't care about what it's like to be disabled. Do you see any parallels between that and racism? Yeah. Like, do you think that there were probably times when you were a cop when something racist was happening, but you didn't even realize it was happening because... Oh, absolutely. Okay, I, I how mean, do you feel about those moments, knowing every, that? That's true for everybody. Is it true for... It I mean, yeah, but not everybody racism, has the kind of power that police racism do. Racism and the way we treat each other was off the charts bad for many, many, many years. And it very slowly turned around. But how could anybody say that they didn't participate? I would never say anything to hurt anybody's feelings, but I have listened to things that I should not have listened to. Why do you think, what do you need? Why do you think you had a hard time standing up to something like that happening? I mean, you already said that you feel like you betrayed those women by not testifying. And that seems like it would have been easy to do. But why do you feel like you had such a hard time standing up when you heard those things happening? Because you want everybody to like you. And if you take the low side, you're gonna, you take the risk of having people turn against you. And you don't have any... Um, strength of character to say, I don't care what happens, I'm going to go for the right side. But were there ever times when you thought maybe this, if maybe if that is something that's required of you to have this job, maybe it's not worth it? And what job? Well, if it's required of you to participate yeah, in bad and, things. Yeah, then why, somebody has why to is be the job there, worth it? Turn the lights off and close the door. Somebody has to stand up for people who can't don't have a voice. You can't just quit. I had to change. Number one, I was a racist. I thought bad thoughts. I allowed bad thoughts. So I had to change myself inside first. Then I was in uh, an, an area where everybody was a racist. And then I had to try and change that. I think it's um, really strong of you to be able to admit that. I think it's important that more people be able to admit that they have been products of white supremacy and um, and to try to do better. What are some of the ways that you think you have tried to do better? Not to participate in it. Not to stand around and guffaw with the boys. Did you end up ever saying anything? No. I would shake my head and walk away. You aren't going to change somebody. That's the same guy that said racial things was the guy that picked on me when I was trying to be a policewoman. And they really gave me a ride. They hid my car keys and buried my hat and did all the things that I would get written up for. There were always 
doing things that were hurtful. But the really nice part is about eight months ago, uh, I had a call from one of the biggest offenders and he said that he was calling for another offender who was dying. And would I be willing to meet with him? He wanted to see me. Now, I hadn't spoken to this person since I got on the, the job because he had always been so negative. I went to his house and he was in his bed. He said that he had been thinking a great deal about how he had given me a really bad time, and he was sorry. He wanted me to know that he was sorry, that I didn't deserve it, that I wasn't a bad person and I wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just trying to get people to laugh. And I said, yeah, but that hurt me a great deal. It hurt my career, it hurt everything about me, because you just wanted to have fun. And he kept saying he was sorry. Did you forgive him? I did. If we all carry on the hate, what have we accomplished? You need to forgive people who make mistakes. You were never perfect. You made mistakes. We forgave you. So... Then on the, way, on the way home, the person who was driving pulled over to the curb. He says, I have something to say. What is it, confession night? He says, I treated you poorly. And I, I can tell you really bad things that he did, but he apologized. And we are friends now. That really made me feel good. But do you think that when people apologize like that, it's more about them than it is the person they hurt? Like, they're just trying to find some sort of way to accept themselves. It's not really about the person they hurt. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that those apologies were more about them trying to make themselves feel better than they were about you? I think they were sincere for a man to grovel for a woman. It's a big thing. One of the things that I'm thinking about with the research that I've been doing, Mom, is um, like violence and how we inherit violence and um, I think about how dad's ancestors and how our English ancestors came to this country and I think about how violent dad was. Um, do you think that this like legacy of violence and the way that violence plays a role in our communities. Do you think that that has a lot to do with why dad was so violent? I don't think I got that. What do you mean? One of those things where I was doing two things at a time. I wasn't, I wasn't being a good listener. Okay. So let me start over. Um, I was saying that I, I think that the way that we came to this country, uh, that the white people came to this country, was really violent. And I wonder sometimes if dad being so violent has a lot to do with this like inherited violence. That dad was so violent and dad was so... Dad was such a mess because of the violence that he inherited. Like, even the way we came to be in this country 
was violent and it creates violent people. I think it's a learned behavior. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, I guess what I'm wondering, because I know that dad learned violence from his dad, and I'm wondering how far back that goes. If you want to know how your dad got his way, study the family history. Your grandfather was a violent man. He served in the Korean War and shot down people and did that. That's not what made him a violent man. He was an alcoholic. He beat his wife. Gordon's mother. He beat Gordon. He beat the other kids. And being an alcoholic, he was depressed. He took a gun and blew his brains out. Your father was the first one on the scene to find his father and had to handle it as a police officer. Dad had to, Dad was the police officer who arrived when Grandpa killed himself? Mm -hmm. And they say that when violence occurs like that, like it was a, a suicide, or that it usually will happen again. Somebody in the family will feel guilt or anger or whatever, not be able to take care of it and kill themselves. Well, your dad was a perfect example. He was constantly taking his gun out, putting his head, said, you don't like this, you don't like that, I'll blow my brains out. He didn't, but that was how he got attention, because he learned that from his father. All the family vacations that his, were so awful that we had, mm -hmm. Grandpa learned that from his father. They used to go every weekend and they would stop in the alley before they got to the, where they were going and say, that's it, you're not going, we're going home. And when all the kids were crying and saying, please, Grandpa, we want to go, and everybody got on their knees and gave him the power, then he was Mr. Nice Guy. By that time, nobody wanted to go. Do you think Dad killed himself? He abused his medication. He smoked. When the doctor told him to smoke is what caused his cancer, he didn't do anything to make himself better. And therefore, he died. But he didn't die from cancer. I don't know that. Is that why you didn't want an autopsy? I didn't see any sense in it. They don't ask for an autopsy unless it's suspicious circumstances. If you've seen a doctor within so many days before the death, then they don't consider that suspicious. And I didn't see any sense in opening that can of worms. So I didn't. Pamela thought that it was I who killed her brother because I didn't want uh, An autopsy, that's not true. This is getting really personal. I mean, this stuff no is pretty question. personal. I thought this was supposed to be about family history. Is how dad died not family history? We don't have to talk about dad, it's okay. I just think that um, growing up I always thought that I never separated dad from the, the institutions that created dad. Like I knew that dad was a product of patriarchy and I knew that dad was a product of white supremacy and violence. and. So I just never separated those two because I knew that he was a product of those things, you know? I never know when to quit. I wonder if that's a flaw. 
Oh, painting wise? No, I find somebody, something I paint, and that's really okay. Yeah, and you have I to learn keep, when not to fuss. I keep dabbing it and dabbing it, and then I get through it. It no longer looks like what I thought it was going to look like. What do you want it to look like? You. Oh. But what do I even look like? You know what I mean? I'm a shapeshifter. You're pretty red. Mm. You're a clean spot. Why do you think Dad was so obsessed with telling the story about us being related to Mary, Queen of Scots? Well, I think that, that would be important for anybody to know that they were a direct descendant of Mary, Queen of Scots and not horse thieves or somebody bad. Do you have any questions you want to ask me? Where's my wedding dress? I don't, I never took your wedding dress. I took, what would I do with your wedding dress? Like, why would I need to borrow your wedding dress? You thinking that I somehow at some point took your wedding dress is just illogical. How can you lose your wedding dress? You, you should, we just talked about personal accountability. You really need to ask yourself how you lost your wedding dress. Had you taken I my stuff? I never touched your wedding dress. Had you taken my stuff without asking in the past? That your wedding dress was in my closet in my right. bedroom. Always. I moved out like 10 years ago. What you've done with that wedding dress in that closet. Why is would all I you, take girl. my wedding dress out of the closet? Why would I take your wedding dress? What would I need your you, wedding why dress Why would for? you take all my evening gowns and give them to all the girls that were going to be? I uh, did not give your yeah. evening gowns away. Your evening gowns are in oh. the shed. And I definitely never took your wedding dress. Also, I which remember, wedding dress are we talking about here, honey? I remember being at a play at University of Laverne. They were wearing girl, some dresses, and then I gave them back. The girl came out, and I said, look at that pretty dress. That looks familiar. You got all those dresses back. That's my back. dress. And the next girl came out. That's my dress. You got all those dresses back, dress. and none of them were your wedding dress, by the you way. You took my dresses and gave them to those girls. If you would do that, you would do anything. Yeah, but that was like when I was an undergrad, and I definitely have never taken your wedding dress. Oh. Why would I take your wedding dress, honestly? I remember when they had the, the choir at the church. Mm -hmm. And I'm leaning up against the piano, and there's this beautiful tablecloth on the piano. Candelabras and all that, and then I realized those are my candelabras. Those are my candles, and it's dripping on my beautiful tablecloth, and they're burning up. And you took them, girl. Listen, I'm going to be accountable for all of that, and I'm going to say I'm sorry that I took so much of your stuff as props for so long. I'm also going to stand by the fact that I have never taken your wedding dress. I'm not going to deny it all uh. because I can't, but I definitely have never taken your wedding dress. Like, that's a for sure thing. We well, can really drop the wedding dress because that in, never happened. In the closet, there were two wedding dresses because I got married two times. Mm -hmm. And the hats and the scarves and the things that went with them. Mm -hmm. You had a wedding scarf? They're gone. I don't know. And I can't imagine a burglar risking going to prison, breaking into my house to take my wedding dresses. Have you tried your shed? I know what's in my shed. Okay. So there's like a couple bodies and two wedding dresses? No wedding dresses. Just bodies, though. Why do you think I took your, like, walk me through the logic of why you think I took your wedding dresses. Because you didn't want to take so much stuff. But yeah. what do you think I would need your wedding dresses for? I never knew why you took all my other stuff. You just chose to think of it as yours. If you lived here, then everything here is yours. 
Mm -hmm. If you wanted my jewelry, you took it. If you wanted my dresses, you took it. I wasn't mad at you, but you never asked me. So I would have probably said yes. But I didn't. Huh? But I didn't. I know, you didn't. But I love you anyway. But don't you see that, like, if you accept the fact that I didn't take your wedding dresses, maybe you could find them because you know that I don't have them because I didn't take them? You're trying to find your wedding dresses? Because you're not going to find them here. I want to be buried in mine. Why? So I won't make any more mistakes. That's funny. Yeah, I made some big ones. Are you trying to say that marrying dad was a mistake? Oh, yeah. We get married and we do things for different reasons. I was looking for strength, strong. Mm -hmm. I had cancer. My first husband was gone. And I was looking for somebody to come in and take over and do everything for me so I didn't have to think or do anything for myself. And I met your father. Not his fault, but I wasted a lot of time. Why didn't you ever leave, Dad? Huh? Why didn't you ever leave, Dad? Well, that, that would be the start of another argument. I know. A 12-year-old child is not old enough to decide what should happen. I'm glad yeah. you can see that right now in this moment, because you can't always. I'm not a very strong person when it comes to myself. When I'm out of here, and it is my job to take care of things, I can be very strong. But when I'm home, I'm kind of a wimp. But don't you think Dad took advantage of that? Yeah. Well, he was looking for somebody weak. Yeah. He was feeling, having a bad time at work, and he felt useless, and he didn't have life the way he wanted it. And there was a pigeon, somebody who he could push around and make himself feel better. What do you think is the biggest like regret that you have in your life? Biggest what? What do you think is the biggest regret that you have? I can't. I can't get that last word. Regret? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I have had a beautiful life, a wonderful life. Even the worst parts of it were good. Even the bad parts, the things I shouldn't have done, were a teaching tool. Mm -hmm. So the next time I was in that spot, I didn't do that again. I feel very good about what I accomplished. I think you get caught up in law enforcement with this urge to get ahead. Everybody's mm -hmm. always talking about the test, the oral interview, the written uh, documents. Everything is aimed at getting ahead. So when you were a patrolman, they asked you, what do you want to do with your life? I just want to be the best patrolman I ever was. I want to stay where I am and be happy. But when in fact what you want is the next level. Mm -hmm. So they asked me, and I told them, and they asked me I was a detective. What did I want to be? I want to be the best detective in the world. And I know some cases I didn't work as hard on as other cases. But I was not a great police officer. I wasn't a bad one either. I never hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. Shot, beat up, or anything. I, I controlled myself. I helped a lot of other people get into the business and do well. What do I regret? 
getting caught up in the I want to get ahead mode. Everybody wants to be the next highest rank. And I ended my career as a patrol, as a captain. I never made peace. The only thing that. That's not something you can control, right? Huh? That's not something you can control, though, right? Well, it's not something I feel bad about because I never had a chance to make peace. There weren't any ladies' peace at the time. I was um, contacted by people who wanted to help me, but they didn't really want to help me. They just wanted to use me. And I, I wasted time trying to be something I wasn't. I don't know if I would have been a good piece or not. In talking to people that I worked with, they tell me that I was the best supervisor that they ever worked for. I used my imagination and what skills I had to make this work fun. I told them if it wasn't going to be fun, I didn't want to do it. But those are all career. Do you have like personal regrets? Like mm -hmm. something you would do again? Do you have personal regrets? You were saying you regretted marrying dad. I had a chance, I think, to relive my relationship with my first husband. And because I had been trained that you never give a man a second chance, I didn't. And I think that was a mistake. But life goes on. Wouldn't he just have kept cheating on you, though? What? Wouldn't he just have kept cheating on you, though? Didn't he cheat on his next wife? Uh, no. Didn't he cheat on all of his wives? No, I think he died soon after that. He... So he stopped cheating because he died? That doesn't sound like he would have stopped well, he cheating. he cheated on his first wife. <laughs> that it sounds was... like he died. <laughs> that was... I try to look at things and the whole picture. Uh -huh. When he was first married, it was sort of a shotgun wedding. He got married in a hurry, and they didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. So they were, um, he was in the military in Germany. Mm -hmm. He flew home. She had the, the wedding all planned. He got off the bus, got in the, went in the church, got married, and they went home and made babies. When he got to know her, they didn't really have a lot in common. She uh, did not like his job. Did not like him, his friends, and was constantly trying to get him to change into something else, like uh, be an engineer, or be a bus driver, or be anything but a cop. And he was unhappy. So when he, I ran into him at a dance, and he indicated that he was interested. I contacted my friends and found out he was married. I don't date married women. So I said no. Shortly thereafter, he showed up on my doorstep, a single man, had stopped seeing her and left seeing her. Seeing her? You mean married to her? He divorced her. Okay. He made his life miserable, mine too. But he was a good husband to me. He cared about me. Treated Besides me when he took your name off of your camper so that he could take his mistress camping. You, you have to look at the whole picture. Okay. Tell me about the whole picture, really. The whole picture. I'm not making excuses for him. 
Okay. But this is the way I see it. Now he's going out with this girl. Okay. How he got together with her was that I was trying so hard to be the police officer that he would be happy with. He was the best cop I ever knew. He was strong and helpful and clean cut. And I was so enamored with his abilities. And then something happened at work where he was at favorite son to turn people against him. And he didn't have any friends and everybody spoke poorly of him and he was busted. And he would come home and sit in the dark and I'm sure feel sorry for himself. And at the same time, I'm going in early, staying late, doing everything I can to be the person he would be enthused about. It was a bad timing. So he got lonely and figured that I must be having uh, an affair because I wasn't being nice to him. So he had an affair. Painting that. When, after we broke up, he would drive for two years. He kept his mail coming to this house. He would, I'd hear him driving up and down the alley. I'd see him at parties and he'd have to come over and ask me who I was with. And I sh it, To me, it showed that he cared about me. He still had it feelings sounds for like me. A, it sounds to me like he was being possessive. That doesn't no, sound to me like he cared. No, he was never that He got jealous because he was an unhappy man. So I wouldn't take him back. I was strong. And he went out and married somebody else. And then he got cancer. And he died. That's when I was, met your father. Do you regret it because you still loved him? Or do you regret it because you think you were wrong for leaving him. Because the one thing that that really happened with that, it's not so much, I mean, mono I, I have my own feelings about monogamy and I think that, you know, it's not always for everybody and that's one thing. But like the, the biggest issue with that relationship is that he was dishonest with you. Don't you think you would have had a really difficult time trusting him after that? Did he what? Don't you think you would have had a difficult time trusting him if you would have gotten back yeah, together? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So what? So, I mean, w have you really thought about what would have happened if you guys got back together? Like, wouldn't it just be a bunch of like accusations? Like, he wouldn't trust you because he'd be waiting for you to do to him what he did to you and. You wouldn't trust him because he already has I a bad track record. I'm saying I made it, I'm saying I understand how it happened. Okay. Do you ever wish that you would have been an artist instead? Do you ever regret that? No. Not at all. Why? Because I like what I do. I love being a police officer. I love helping people, doing the right thing. Do you have any more questions for me that don't involve whether or not I took your wedding dress? Don't involve what? Whether or not I took your wedding dress. <laughs> no, I can't think of any. You uh, you asked me why I didn't leave your father. I thought about it many times. I said I was going to. It finally got a little bit better when I, every time we'd have an argument, he'd take the gun and say, I'm leaving. And then if I kill myself, it's your fault. Uh, then 
I would cry and beg him not to go and feel like a fool. Then one night he did his trick and I said, go ahead, shoot yourself. And he said, well, that's not a very good attitude. And I said, I've been listening to you say you want to do it for years. I think you should try it out, see if it works. He never did it again. Isn't that how Grandpa died? Because... Um Grandma called his bluff, and then he did it. That's what I heard. I heard that he had threatened again, and he had the shotgun. And she said, well, go ahead and do it then. And then he did. That's what Grandma told me. That's what I heard, too. Maybe Dad never really wanted to do it. So, my question is, have you had a good life? Um, yeah. I mean, you know me. I'm, like, very existential with the shits. And so I, I don't know what, like, I feel like, I feel like the idea of happiness that we have been given is not actually achievable. And I feel like, the version of happiness we've been given has been given to us to create like a feeling of emptiness that so that we seek I don't know, either religion or objects or whatever to like fill that emptiness. So in the traditional sense of the word, I don't know if I've ever been happy, but I don't regret the choices I've made. Like I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm here, you know, mm-hmm. where I'm at. I don't regret, I don't regret dropping out of law school, and I don't regret um, becoming an artist, and uh, instead, and I don't, I don't regret any of that stuff. Do you regret me not going to law school? Regret what? Do you regret me not going to law school? No. That was never a push of mine. I just thought that was something. If you enter college with an idea of what you want to be when you come out to the other end, you're much more successful. So I was trying to give you something to hang your hat on. I don't care what you are. I don't really have a lot of good opinions about Liars. So if anything, it sounds like you're glad I didn't become an attorney? What? I said, if anything, it sounds like you're glad I didn't become an attorney? Maybe. Do you think I'm happy? I think so. That's a idea. Since I met? Yeah. Before that. Do you think a do you think a person made me happy? Yeah. Can I tell you uh, the secret of life? I had to be a happy person to attract that person. Okay. Psychology one A. Yeah. He didn't complete me. I was the person who attracted him already, but I had to already be that person. I think I would be the same person if I didn't end up dating him. I made a mess. That's good. Do you? Th- what do you think is messier, art or life? What's messy about your life? No, I said. <laughs> uh, I said, what do you think is messier, art or life? Life. What you got, kid? Well, 
You ready? It's not totally done. I have to put some details in it. I'll open with a uh, full house. Okay. What do you got? So, here is yours. Oh my god. You put hair on me. I did put hair on you. You thought I was going to leave you without hair? That would have been so weird. Very cool. Very controlled. I yeah. like that. That's cool. I like your haircut. Thank you. Thank you. Are you going to put a background on it or are you going to leave it? Huh? Are you going to put a background on it or are you going to leave it that color? I like the way it is. Okay. I'm not big on background. If I give you another canvas, because I have one more that's the exact same as this panel, will you do a self-portrait? Mm -hmm. Because you know how I did my portrait of myself and then I just made one of you? Will you make a self-portrait on the other panel if I give it to you? Okay. And then we'll have both of them. Does that sound cool? What I would like to you and what I would like to me. Yeah. Okay. No problem. I love you. I love you too. I love you infinity and there's no higher but there's same. Yeah, there is. There times, is higher. Times two. There is no higher but there's same. That's your rules, not my rules. We've had those rules since I was a kid. I know. We're changing I'm, them now. We've been arguing about them since okay. we were a kid. Okay. I love you more. I love you more. Hey, let's argue about it. That's true. Yeah. Thanks, Mom. You're welcome.